the, the trip to Japan this time around is merely for promotional reasons? Yes, uh, and to discuss future projects here oh, really? in Japan. Yeah. Such as? Such as live tour, live video, live album. Mm-hmm. It's been quite a while since you've been here. Actually, come to Japan. We, we were here in uh, 1977. Yeah, yeah. And, 15 uh, years. 15 years ago. <laughs> it is quite a long time, really. We are regular, though. Every 15 years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Come on, we'll be back in 15 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I say we are right. Uh, oh yeah. Things in here. Great. The, um, she was a question you've probably been bombarded with, but why is the band being revived after the nine-year hiatus? Um, in uh, '87, uh, Polydor put a, a record out in England called Changing Faces, which was the greatest hits of 10ZC and Godly and Cream. And uh, it went platinum very quickly. And they did some market research as to how a new a studio album would be um, taken by the, the public. And uh, when we got together to accept these platinum discs for, the, uh, for Changing Faces, they asked us if we'd like to, uh, you know, Eric and I would like to get together again and do a new album. And we said we would, you know, try it and see what happened. Do they actually do market research, like focus on yeah. fans? Yeah, mm. they do. Yeah. Like yeah. It's yeah. more like a hit or miss type of proposition. Oh, no, 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 no. no. If you look at the credibility of a band in, uh, in Britain, strangely enough, we, we were honest. After, after eight years of never releasing anything, we were on a par with Pink Floyd as far as public recognition and acceptability of product was concerned. This sounds like real market research stuff and it's incredibly boring, but the facts are the facts. The facts are the facts and they, they obviously knew that there's a public out there for a new album. So they asked us to do one. Now, now the band f- formally disbanded at one point in, in, in 83. Did you actually your we didn't know. We never formally disbanded. We just ceased to... Just stop working. To, yeah, it just sort of... We did a tour. What had happened was that since probably sort of 79, 78, 79, we hadn't really had any big hit singles. and But we kept touring, and we used to, you know, do very well on tour, but it became increasingly like a nostalgia people were only coming to hear the old material they weren't interested in the new recordings we were making and uh, I think that sort of finally got to us and we just sort of we did one tour and never did anything else so we never did a farewell tour we never said well that's it it was kind of left open you didn't die you just stopped breathing correct <laughs> we, yeah we went into hibernation <laughs> went to sleep for a few hundred yeah. years Rip Van Winkle <laughs> I, I don't interpret for it. Just, if I can just add one more thing there. Hence the title of the, the new album was Meanwhile. Because everybody said, well, what have you been doing? Was, well, Meanwhile, this is it. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, uh, I was trying to confirm the reasons for your getting the band together and what were the actual motivations behind it. And... You know, you talk about the market research and how Pink Floyd are on the same level as Pink yeah. Floyd. They made us a very generous offer as well. <laughs> okay. But he's also wondering about like personal feelings about the band, 10CC, maybe more like uh, emotion, emotional uh, reasons for getting the band together. Can... Well, we, the other thing that prompted us to do something for 10CC <clears throat> was we felt personally that there was a huge gap in the market in Britain for what we knew we could do really well. We could write songs that had melody words, interesting chords, and bloody good sound. We knew we could do that, because that's what we always did. As Graham said in the, in the early 80s, we weren't in fashion. We came through the punk era, and we weren't the flavor of the month. But there was this gap when we were asked to do this record, and we said, we should fill it, because there are people still out there that want people of our sort of age group as well that, that nobody was catering for. Something I guess we would call pop music. Pure yeah, pop. middle of the road pop music. Yeah, AOR. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, more AOR really. AOR. Mm-hmm. When you say AOR, what does that stand Adult orientated yeah. rock. Yeah, some people think of it as album for you. Oh right, well there is that. Adult. Yeah. 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 
These are individual questions for each of you about what you were doing during the interim. And the first is for Eric. Um, you worked with Paul McCartney, uh, right? Yeah. So how do you evaluate the actual work you, you uh, put out with Paul? How I rate it? Yeah, how would you evaluate it? Um, I think the, the songs written were, were very good. I think the production of the songs didn't justify the quality that we originally had. But that's, it's not my project, you know, it's, it's Paul's project, it's his album and mm -hmm. he, he, he is the king in this case and uh, I really wasn't in control of anything on that side. So, I enjoyed, I loved writing with him, and um, it was very exciting to write with anyone who's been such an influence on music, uh, but in retrospect, I don't think the project went up the right avenue, I think it was led in a different direction, and unfortunately, didn't uh, come out as good as I thought it was going to. How would you go back and change it if you could? Just to get better hypothetical. I'd go back to the original backing tracks in the studio and just put Paul's voice on, and the thing would sound like something two million times better. The backing tracks are wonderful. There are four guys playing, and it's as raw and as and as exciting as the Beatles. But when you start putting a production on like Hugh Padgham and 2,000 electronic overdubs the thing sounds, it loses its credibility for me. And uh, I, I've, I've obviously discussed this many times with Paul since, and we agree. Mm. When it was reported that you had collaborated with Paul McCartney, there was talk in certain quarters that he had sort of begun to, to lose his songwriting skills, or they had begun to deteriorate, and you were sort of the hired gun hired gun called on uh, to come in and keep things at a reasonable level. But many people have said this over the years about Paul because he didn't have this sounding board, John Lennon, to write with. But if you, if you, really, if you find out about what happened in, the, in, in all the Beatles' writings, you find that many of the great songs weren't written by the two of them anyway. You know, Lady Madonna was Paul, and the Royal Walrus was John, etc., etc., but I think he did need someone to bounce off. Um, again, in retrospect, I don't think I, I am a strong enough person. And you are dealing with someone who's been the, the most successful songwriter in history. It's very difficult to tell somebody like that if you feel he's not coming up to the standard you feel he should. I mean, you do tell him. But it's like the Emperor's New Clothes. So is he going to believe you? And how far do you want to take it? Um, a lot of politics and head, head uh, banging involved. So <clears throat> I think he, on the stuff he's done since the split of the Beatles, there are a couple of albums like the first McCartney album and Ram, uh, which I thought were brilliant. Yeah. He, he just captured it. He, he, he had it. And it was still had that. Beatle thing. Beatle had. thing. <laughs> but he, he did get softer on the Wings albums, and um, a lot of them I, I didn't like very much. Um, but if, again, if somebody's done something so good, why why should you expect him to be perfect every time he releases something? It's impossible. He's human. Uh, so again, looking back in retrospect, what? Do you think your final contribution was? I mean, what, what effects, positive effects, did you have on him in collaborating? Again, as I said, if if you could if you could listen to the original backing tracks, you'd find a very raw rock and roll album, which is what I was hoping to influence in my input with his songs, and to get away from some of the softer um, softer lyric 
content of some of his previous albums. There was so, something interesting that you you, you told me because we've obviously talked about you know Eric Rowton with Paul that uh, I found very interesting that when uh, Eric thought that Paul had sort of started something really really good, you know, you'd encourage him, and he'd kind of reject it. And when he started something that you thought was bad, he'd want to carry on with it. it was kind of contrary, really. Yeah. And I would, you know, trust what Eric liked to be to be good, you know, judging from what Paul's done in recent years, which I think has been below par. Yeah, it's an interesting situation to sit and write with somebody or sit in the studio and start to lay the thing down on tape. And you do hear... He is a genius, there's no doubt about that. You know that from what he's written. The guy's got it in his head. And he can just sit at a piano and start to sing something and you say, that is great, that is incredible, let's do it. And he'll say, no, we can do better than this. Let's do something else. What the reason for that is, I have no idea. I have no idea, but it, it happens. It's I would very, say. very frustrating. <laughs> Very frustrating, but um, you know he's 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 got a song on our, on our album <clears throat> with something that we started. Again, it is an example of something that we never finished because he didn't think it was good enough. But I always thought it was a great idea for a song, a song called "Don't Break the Promises." I played it to Graham, and Graham saw the potential of it as well. So we completed it, and then Paul rang me up and said, "You guys got it. You got it right. But it's great, wonderful. Keep sending the checks." Because <laughs> I'm, I'm short of money this week. <laughs> Are you acquainted with the actual material that, uh, that Eric and, and Paul put out? And do you have. Uh, uh, can you listen to your evaluation on it? Uh, yes, I did listen to it, obviously. Uh, I was actually working with Andrew Gold at the time, and he's a big McCartney fan, and he met up. He's a friend of ours anyway um, I was uh, there, were, there was one song um, that I liked a lot um, but I can't remember the title of the um, da, 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 um, the two uh, signs of the Zodiac uh, what does it call that song? oh um, yeah <laughs> you wrote it <laughs> yeah I wrote it yeah another one you mean I like that one a lot I thought it was really good and uh, the other ones I mean I thought there was they were good, but not like the greatest thing I'd ever heard. I mean, generally, for me, after sort of Band on the Run, Paul lost it, and it was no disrespect to Eric that it didn't sort of <laughs> improve it any, you know. You get the odd flash of thing with McCartney that is great, but it's nothing like his former self. And, Graham, you're... Uh, uh Wax project yes. uh, has been pretty well received here. Yeah. It's been re-released in, C in CD format. What, in retrospect, what exactly was the concept of work there with Wax? It was just working with somebody that I enjoyed working with. Um, I, I met Andrew through. It was because of Ten CC that uh, that I, I met Andrew. He was brought in uh, to co-produce and co-write some tracks for an album that we had already recorded in England um, but our American label Warners wanted the album to have more of an American sort of slant so they suggested that we work with an American writer-producer and that was Andrew. Uh, what, what did they mean by that? Well they wanted, to, I suppose, they wanted, they thought that by working with an American that the album would sound more American or be more suited to the American market. They probably thought it was too English I mean, this is a load of bollocks, isn't it, really? But the good part about it was that we had a lot of... We enjoyed working with him. The, the three tracks, actually, that Andrew uh, co-wrote and produced with us all were all singles. They weren't hits, but it does say a lot for his input that the three tracks that he did, all the three of those were singles. And um, after Eric and I decided that, you know, we'd not, we weren't going to continue with... Wax with the 10cc for another nine years. <laughs> we were going to have a nine-year break. Um, I'd, I'd set up a studio at home, and uh, I was finding it a bit lonesome, you know. So I gave Andrew a ring and asked him to come over to England and 